Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's topic is one that comes up so much in my community and my membership and in my private coaching and on our Facebook groups, and that is siblings, specifically sibling fights and sibling rivalry. And if you have uh, one child, this still may be helpful for you when it comes to navigating playdates or cousin relationships. So do give a listen because you might still find some helpful nuggets in this episode. First of all, I just want to say that this is one of the hardest things that we encounter as parents, uh, that sense of sibling rivalry and sibling fights. And it can just be the cause of so much difficult behavior. So just right off the bat, know that you're not alone, that everyone that I talk to who has more than one child struggles with this at some point. So just take a deep breath, give yourself a big hug, because you are not alone. This is really, really tough. This is going to be a really jam-packed episode, and I just want to say I've also put together a little booklet of goodies for you that you can download, including um, a cheat sheet that goes over the, the best practices that we're going to be talking about today to remind yourself, a couple of printables and a script that you might find useful for intervening in sibling fights. If you would like that free download, you can go to sarahrosensweet.com forward slash siblings. That's sarahrosensweet.com forward slash siblings to get your free download with some of the highlights of this episode and some cheat sheets and an example script for intervening in a sibling fight. So definitely do check that out. We're going to be covering what I call the four best practices for um, helping siblings get along and for reducing sibling fighting. You're probably never going to end sibling fights, but you certainly can reduce them. Just to give you a little sense of where we're going in this episode, our four best practices that we're going to be going deeper into for helping siblings get along are making sure that you have a good, solid relationship, individual relationship with each child. The second one is having clear and consistent sharing rules and property rules. The third is making sure that you're intervening in sibling fights in a neutral way. And the fourth is helping your child with their big feelings about a sibling. And it could be that those big feelings have really turned into what we call a chip on their shoulder. So those are the four big ideas that we're going to be talking about today. So let's go back to the first one, which is really working on that one-on-one relationship with your child. It can seem counterintuitive. We often think as parents, we've got to help the kids work on their relationship with each other if they're squabbling. But this is the thing sibling fighting or sibling rivalry is always about fear of who do mom or dad love best do they love my sibling more than they love me so it's really not even about the sibling relationship it's about their relationship with you and whether they feel confident that they have you and that they have enough of you and that you love them as much as you love their sibling I love the analogy that I got. This is a a classic book, the book Siblings Without Rivalry. I love the analogy that the authors talk about. Imagine that your partner comes home one day and says to you, darling, I love you so much that I've decided to get us a new partner. And they have a new partner there that you have to watch that your partner gaze lovingly at the new partner and snuggle with a new partner. And everywhere you go, people are admiring the new partner. That's really what it's like for our older child when we bring home a new baby is they're filled with fear. Why did they replace me? Aren't I good enough? Do they still love me? Will my needs get met? And don't worry if you if you feel that, oh, we could have done better with that when the baby was born because it's never too late. But if we don't help our older child with those big feelings right from the start, they can it can sort of create this pattern of fear and, well, rivalry, really. Do they still love me? So the answer to that is to help them know 
that their needs will be met, that you do still love them, that they are good enough, and that you are going to make time for them and you're going to delight in them. So we want to use all of our peaceful parenting strategies, our connection strategies, to help our child feel that connection and that love and that their needs will be met and that that we do delight in them every day. One way we can do that is special time. I'll put a guide book, a little guide I have about special time in the show notes. And special time Uh, 15 minutes a day with you and your child playing. I'm all yours for the next 15 minutes. That's sort of our gold standard in peaceful parenting, that 15 minutes a day, one-on-one time with each parent and each child. And that might be too tall of an order for you right now. Do the best you can with it. If you can only get special time on the weekends, maybe try and make it a little bit longer. Or if you can only get special time when you have some support, do that. But really try as much as you can to get that one-on-one time with each child that is going to do wonders for them feeling like you love them and they are good enough and they don't have to compete with their sibling for your attention or your love. So that's our first big idea, really working on that one-on-one relationship and building it up and, and increasing the connection that you feel with each child or that they feel with you. Our second big idea is to have clear property and sharing rules. So what we suggest in peaceful parenting, and again, we've got this in the cheat sheet. If you go to sarahrosensweet.com forward slash siblings, you can download this. So what we suggest is that if there is something that belongs to just one child that they got for their birthday or any sort of gift or that they bought with their own money, that thing is theirs and they never have to share it if they don't want to. Each child in the family should have their own property and we should help them protect their property. Just like you wouldn't like it if I came over to your house and you know asked if I could borrow your car and you didn't want to lend me your car, but your partner's like, why don't you let her use it? You're not even using it right now. Or if your partner said, come on, be kind, you know, you've got you've got this beautiful brand new car, just let Sarah have a turn with it. That wouldn't feel good, would it? It would feel it would make you feel powerless and resentful. And it wouldn't contribute to any feelings of goodwill that you had towards me. So that's what happens with our with our children. If we force our child to share things that are just theirs with their sibling, it really increases the rivalry. And and it actually decreases generosity that We could talk about that another day because we're just talking about siblings today. But forced sharing makes children resentful of their sibling. To this end, we also want to make sure that the child in question or each child has a place to keep their things, a shelf in their room or a, a toy box or something where they can put special things that they don't want anyone to touch without asking. Of course, they're free to share if they want to, but everyone, if it's theirs, the other kids have to ask, can I use this thing? And they're completely free to say no, no shame. It's their thing. And we really want to help them with that sense of ownership because it really lets them relax and doesn't make that resentment build up of, you know, I never get what I want. You know, my parent won't even protect my very, very special toy that I got, and it's all the sibling's fault. So that really drives the resentment. If it's community property and it belongs to everyone in the family, we've got a different uh, guideline, and that is called long turns. This is something that Heather Schumacher talks a lot about in her book, It's Okay Not to Share. And I just love this. And in fact, I didn't know about this when my kids were little. And when there was something that belonged to everyone and both kids wanted to play it or, or you know, all three, I would set a timer and, you know, you can use it for 10 minutes and then you can use it for 10 minutes. And, you know, honestly, do we really want to be the timer police and be keeping track of whose turn it is and for how long? So if it's a child's turn to play with something and it's something that belongs with to everyone in the family, that child can play with it for as long as they want. My opinion is that a long turn can last for an entire day, and then the next day, it's somebody else's chance to use it. So say you get you know, a special new pogo stick. I don't know why I just thought of pogo stick, but you get a pogo stick and child, it's for the whole family. Child A wants to use it. As long as they're actively using the pogo stick, they can use it for as long as they want to. And child B has to wait their turn Turns last for while you're actively using it, so there's no reserving the pogo stick to play with it later after they play with something else. Of course, they can go to the washroom or, you know, have lunch or something, but if they're still actively playing with it, their turn still goes on. When they're done with it, the other child gets to use it. This can be really tough. Um, What I've seen is that it takes a lot of patience on our part to support 
the child whose turn it isn't to support them emotionally through their upset. When like, I his turn is lasting forever. Why can't I have a turn? I want to use the pogo stick. So we need to say, I know, you know, you wish that you could play with it right now. And it's so hard to wait. And did you tell your brother that you'd like a turn when he's done with it? You did? Okay, great. So as soon as your brother's done with it, it's going to be your turn. And maybe depending on the age of the child, you might have to do a little help them figuring out something to do while they're waiting. But the beautiful thing is that they will come to learn that when it's their turn, they get to use it for as long as they want. And that's a really, you know, a powerful thing for kids to be able to really move through the work that they're doing is really play is the work of childhood. And they need to be able to feel free in their play to be able to not feel anxious that at any moment, you know, someone's going to stop them or it's going to be taken away. And when that does happen, you know, if we if we weren't doing the long turns and one child whined, you know, I want the pogo stick now. And then the other the parent says, OK, that's it. Your turn's over. You've had it long enough. It's your brother's turn guess what we're going to have? Resentment. So all of these things, it's really interesting. I I keep finding myself wanting to go a little bit off topic with these things because other things will come up for me as I'm talking. Like I wanted to talk about how generosity is developed in children. And, you know, here I want to talk about how emotional resilience is developed by knowing that it's not their turn right then, but that they have to wait and that they can handle it. Um, But let's, I'm going to try to stick more to really the sibling rivalry aspect of what I'm talking about today. So if we take something away from a child because we've decided they've had it long enough and it's their sibling's turn, then we get more rivalry. So do you see where I'm going with this? Having clear sharing and property rules is going to decrease the resentment among the children because it's always about who does mom or dad love best? You know, are they choosing me or are they choosing my sibling? And if we're forcing them to share or saying their turn is over, they clearly feel that we're choosing their sibling. Along with not contributing to rivalry or resentment, is that it's actually going to mean that your children will have fewer fights. There will not be a question of, you know, how long is his turn going to be or can I use his thing? Because you're already going to have these things set out in, as part of your family guidelines. Nobody has to share something that they don't want to. And if you're playing with it and it belongs to everyone, you can use it for as long as you want. So right there, I bet you're thinking to yourself, oh yeah, a lot of our fights are me trying to figure out a solution to the problem that they're having over a toy. So once you have these clear guidelines, a lot of this is going to be taken care of in terms of the the common squabbles and fights that kids have. This leads me to our third big idea of helping siblings get along better, which is that we need to intervene in a neutral way. You might hear some people say that we shouldn't intervene at all, that we should let them figure it out themselves. Or maybe you were raised with parents who are more conventional and they just came in and said, you know, that's it, no more fighting, you get this and you get that. And I just don't want to don't want to hear any more about it. And as you've probably figured out by now, that approach where the parents decides is going to lead to resentment and more fighting down the road for kids. So we don't want to come in and just decide things. We don't want to be the judge and jury, because that really is going to increase the resentment and rivalry when they feel that we've chosen their sibling over them. So as I just said, and then some people think we shouldn't intervene. We should let them figure it out themselves. That makes a little bit of sense if you don't want to be the judge and jury because that increases the rivalry and resentment. On the other hand, kids are fighting because they don't know how to work it out themselves. And there are a couple of dangers that I see that happen really commonly when we don't intervene in fights if they can't work it out. Of course, you want to listen from the next room and see, you know, if there's an argument happening, can they work it out? How's it going? We're not going to rush in at every disagreement and intervene, but we want to listen. Is is anyone sounding really upset? Um, is anyone sounding a little bit dysregulated or hijacked? And then we, we do want to intervene. And this is why. If we don't intervene, what often happens is either physical violence, that things can come to blow because people get upset and they actually don't know how to work it out. Or we can see that the dominant child always gets their way. And it's not the oldest child necessarily who's the dominant child. But there's often one child in siblings who's more dominant than the others. And the the less dominant child might just learn, I never get what I need. I never get what I want. I might as well just give up. So we don't want that to happen either. So what do we do instead? I've got a script for this. I'm not going to go into like great detail about this in the podcast because otherwise it would just be like really super long. That's in the download that I was telling you about at sarahrosensweet.com forward slash siblings. So what we want to do when we're intervening in a fight is we want to think of ourselves as the mediator. 
We're not the negotiator. A negotiator comes in and tries to make solutions, make suggestions, come up with something that's going to end the fight. We want the children to do that themselves. But as I mentioned before, they don't know how to work it out. They are not very good at conflict resolution. They're just learning these skills. And heck, some of us adults aren't very good at conflict resolution. So what we want to think of ourselves as a neutral mediator that is helping the children talk to each other and come up with their own solutions. So this takes some practice. It takes some time. You're not going to be able to do this every single time. But if you can do it, you know, maybe once a day or as much as feels reasonable to you, your children will start to learn these skills themselves. So what this looks like in practice, um, say you've got two little kids fighting over who gets to use this Lego guy, the guy with the orange helmet that they both like. And so you come in and you you hear that they're fighting and you say, whoa, 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 kids, you know, what's going on? I'm here to help. And you might find it helpful to talk to your kids ahead of time about this new strategy that you're going to be using, just because if it's heated, it can be hard for them to think and understand what's going on. So you might, you know, sit them down after you hear this episode and check out the script that I'm um, going to give you in the download. And you might say, listen, kids, we're going to do something new around here. Next time you have a disagreement with your brother or your sister, we're going to we're going to talk about it and each of you is going to get a turn to talk and say what you think and what the problem is from your point of view and what your side of the story is. And don't worry, you're going to get a chance to say it and your other sibling's going to get a chance to say it and I want to listen to both of you. I want to hear exactly what's going on. So that's what we're going to be doing from now on. So that when you are in the heat of the moment, they will be a little bit prepared for this new method that you're going to be using. So you come into the playroom, they're fighting over this Lego guy, and you say, whoa, 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 kids, kids, what's going on? I'm here to help. It sounds like you're having a problem. And, you know, you say to child A, child A, tell me what's going on. Child A says, you know, I wanted to use it, and and he put it down, and now he says it's his, and, and so on. And this is not a situation that's clear where you can apply our sharing and property rules. So both kids are upset. Both kids want the same Lego, uh, the Lego guy with the helmet. And child A is saying, you know, their side of the story. And you say, oh, child A, that does sound difficult. And you mirror back to child A, what the problem, do I hear this? Do, do I have this right? You know, you said blah, blah, blah. And so you, you repeat back to child A and maybe child B is interrupting. If they were like my kids, they'd be like, no, that's not true. That's not what happened. And you say to child B, child B, I hear you. It's going to be your turn in just a minute. I want to hear what you have to say. Everyone gets a chance to talk. And maybe you're holding child B's hand. Well, this is happening. So they know they will get a chance to talk. So you, you hear child B's side of the story. You hear child A's side of the story. You repeat it back to both of them. Do I have this right? And again, there's a script for this in the download. Do I have this right? Okay, wow, that does sound like a problem. And then you say to them, who has an idea for how we can solve this problem? They've each listened to each other. They've clearly communicated what their point of view is and um, what the situation is. And so there's the conflict. And just a side note, if kids are really upset, this it's going to be hard to do this. So you really want to maybe even take a break. Let's read a story while we all calm down. Let me give you a hug. You're both so upset. You can empathize with them. That's one of the steps in in our script. And you might not be able to do the problem solving right away. And if, if they're upset, it won't work because nobody ever wants to solve a problem until they feel acknowledged and empathized with. So really work on soothing and empathizing. Take a break if you have to until you can get back to the problem solving. So that's the step we're moving into next is wow, that does sound like a problem. You know, you wanted the Lego guy and your sibling also wants the Lego guy. And who has an idea for how we can solve this problem? You can write the ideas down. Um, Even if kids can't read, they know that it's important if you're writing it down. So you want to ask them each for ideas. And if your kids are anything like mine, the ideas are going to be very one-sided and it will be something like, well, I should just get it. And you can say, okay, that's an idea. You know, child B, how do you feel about that? Child A says that they should just get the Lego guy. And child B, no, that's not, that's not fair. That's not what I want. And then you say, oh, child A looks like that is not a solution that works for everybody. We're looking here for solutions that work for everybody. So you go back to the drawing board and you keep taking ideas until they come up with an idea. 
This is hard at first and it does take some practice and if you have some pretty entrenched sibling rivalry it takes time for them to have goodwill towards each other to want to find a solution and they will pick up on it and it does get easier I promise and it's hard at first and it feels like slow going and it takes a lot of time and honestly one thing that I have found quite funny is that when kids know that you're seriously committed to this process of conflict negotiation and resolution with them they will work faster to find a solution because they just don't want to listen to you talk anymore. (laughs) They want to get back to playing. So I think that's a really funny uh, sort of a side benefit to this kind of a little bit uh, drawn out process of, you know, the listening and the mirroring and the looking for solutions. They're, They're much more willing to move quickly to a solution that works for everybody so they can get back to their game. So when you do find that solution, it's usually going to be something that if even if you had suggested it, they wouldn't have taken it because of course everyone is happier with an idea when they've thought of them themselves. And they can also come up with some really creative ideas that maybe we would never even have thought of. I remember this one parent that I was working with, her two little boys were fighting over who got to be the front of a pretend train that they were making out of boxes. And they went through this whole process and finally one of them said, I know, this train can have two engines. And the other little boy was like, yeah, two engines. And they went away happily with their solution that they had come up with themselves with the mom as the mediator, right? The mom isn't the one who was negotiating, well, how about if the train has two engines? The mom was actually mediating that discussion that they were having until they were able to work out a solution that worked for both of them. The big idea here is really that we are just helping the two sides learn to talk to each other and help them come up with ideas and present them to each other so that they can find a solution. And that's really what conflict resolution is all about. It's about listening to the other side, and it's about uh, coming up with solutions that work for everyone. That's our third big idea, is to intervene in sibling fights in a neutral way. First of all, so that we're not increasing the resentment, because when we are judge and jury, we are increasing the resentment, which fuels the rivalry and the fighting. And the second reason we want to do that is so that our kids learn conflict negotiation so that they have those skills that they can bring with them out in the world and not only just use with their sibling. When my boys were little, they were pretty good at that. And I would hear them saying to each other, how about this? Or how about that? You know, you can picture how about with the apostrophe instead of the A. And they would have you know, some sort of arguing about something and one would say, how about we do this? Or how about we do that? And they would work it out because they were, they were pretty good at making suggestions and trying to cooperate and trying to negotiate what would work for both of them. Again, I know it's really hard not to take sides because we may think that we know exactly what's going on or who's right or who's wrong. But anytime we take a side, even if we're right, even if we're super careful to never choose one child more often than the other, It's that act of choosing, it's that act of being that judge and jury that drives the resentment and causes the fighting and hurts the children's relationships with each other. I know I went over it really quickly, but again, the the script and the steps for you are in that download at sarahrosensweet.com siblings, so just check that out. Our fourth and final big idea, so we've had working on your individual relationship with each child. We've had the property and sharing rules, and we've had intervening in sibling fights in a neutral way. Those are their first three big ideas. And our final big idea is about healing that chip on their shoulder and really giving each child a chance to be heard and to be empathized with and for us to really listen to their feelings about the other child. And you may not be at this point where you've got some really deep-seated resentment, or maybe you do, and you see, you know, it doesn't matter if you weigh the ice cream in your kitchen scale. One child is always going to say, his is bigger. Why do you always give him the bigger one? Or if, you know, you're, you're, one of your kids is playing with something, and no matter what it is, the other child always wants to snatch it away from them. It's not about the toy. It's not about the ice cream. It's about who do you love more? Who does mom or dad love more? Is there enough for me? I need what they have. They've taken everything away from me. And so I know I'm sounding dramatic, but if you go back to our example about if your partner brings home a new partner, it really is that dramatic for kids. It really is real to them, those feelings of loss and fear 
and wondering if you still love them and, and if they're good enough. And, and if we don't do a really careful job of helping them with that when the kids are born or when the new child is born, then it can really grow over time. And especially if we've, you know, if we've been forcing sharing or if we've been deciding fights, and I know we are all doing the best we can with the information that we have available to us at the time. So really, there's no, I, I'm not shaming anyone here. I know that most of the things that I'm talking about are not in conventional parenting, right? Peaceful parenting can be pretty fringy. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, gee, I really caused a lot of this resentment and fighting that my kids are having, it's never too late. You can start now. And, you know, if you've been going down this road of some sort of bad sibling Ravelry for a few years, this is when you really might want to think about doing some healing. Or or also if you're at the juncture where you are having a new baby and your child is is filled with these feelings of doubt and fear, this is the time for you to have this conversation where all you're going to do is listen. My favorite time for having these conversations is at night in bed when you have a quiet moment. And so you do want to have this time alone. You don't want to have this conversation in front of your other child. You want to find that quiet moment where you're feeling close and connected and you can just start the conversation by saying, I wonder. So I wonder if it's really hard to be a big brother or I wonder if it's really hard to be a little sister or I wonder if it's really hard for you to share me or me and your other parent with your sibling. <sighs> I, I I understand. And if you have siblings, maybe you can, you know, talk about what it was like for you when you were a kid, even if you have to sort of embellish because you don't really remember, but you might say something like, oh, I remember when I was little and it was so hard having a little sister. And sometimes I just even wish that she wasn't born. And I know that sounds dramatic. It's very hard for parents to hear things like that sometimes or even to you know, say something like that. But children really do sometimes wish that they were the only child and they do have feelings sometimes that they wish that their brother or sister was never born and i'm not saying that that can't be healed but first we have to bring it to the light of day we have to let those feelings surface and come up to be healed and as long as they're hidden away in the dark they're gonna they're going to fester and build up and you know really drive that rivalry so what we're doing is just really giving our child an opportunity to express however life feels for them and having a sibling feels for them. I don't know what your child's going to say. It's possible your child might even say, no, nope, I'm fine. You know, maybe they don't want to talk about it. And then you can say, okay, well, if you ever want to talk about it, I'm here to listen and all your feelings are okay with me. And you can check in with them later. You know, I noticed things were kind of hard with your brother today. I wonder if it's just sometimes hard being a big brother etc. So those I wonder statements when you're feeling close and connected and then your job is just to listen whatever comes out of their mouth and it, and it could be hard to hear could be I hate him I wish he was dead I could be I wish that you never had any other kids it could be you know I want you to send the baby back to the hospital I had a client once who found her three-year-old dragging the baby across the floor by his heels and of course she was alarmed what are you doing and the little boy said, I'm taking him to the garbage. If you hear something really hard like that, take a few deep breaths, give yourself some love and compassion, remind yourself that you're just, you just need to listen and this is helping all of those feelings to be healed by your listening and your warm and loving presence and compassion. It's not the time to point out, but you have so much fun together sometimes or, but you're such a great big sister. It's not the time to do any fixing or trying to talk them out of their feelings just listening and understanding. That's what's going to bring the healing that is going to melt away that chip on their shoulder. I remember once I was talking to some girlfriends and telling them about a workshop that I was teaching about introducing a new baby and why that was so important because our older child can develop these chips on their shoulder toward their sibling. And one of my friends who was an older sibling said, oh, I still hate my younger sibling. And the other one who was a younger sibling said, my older sibling still hates me. So if we don't really work hard at trying to help do some healing here and help these feelings come to light and be heard so that they can dissipate, we could end up with kids who have lifelong chips on their shoulder about the other one. Those are our four big ideas about helping siblings get along better and trying to reduce that resentment and reduce the fighting. 
I hope you found these really helpful. Again, for the highlights and the cheat sheet and the script for intervening in a fight, you can go to sarahrosensweet.com siblings. We'll also put that link in the show notes. And I look forward to hearing how this was helpful for you. Please join us in our free Facebook group, Peaceful Parenting with Sarah Rosen Sweet. We've got a lovely group of parents in there who are supporting each other all on this journey of peaceful parenting. I'd love to hear about how this sibling podcast episode has been helpful for you and how it's working for you. You can also find me over on Instagram at Sarah Rosen Sweet. If you found this episode helpful, please share it with a friend. I would love to reach as many families as we can and make this world a better place, one family at a time, being peaceful and loving each other and lifting each other up. So please share this with a friend and I will see you next time. Don't forget to check out the download. Again, sarahrosensweet.com siblings. You can find some goodies that I've put together just for you to help you as you are putting into practice some of these strategies that we've talked about today. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.